Welcome to the program. I'm Mark Imperial. This segment's being brought to you by BooksGrowBusiness.com. It's the place where busy professionals get their books done to educate their consumers, grow their practices, and to leave a legacy. We're doing a series of spotlights on remarkable advisors across the country. And joining me on this segment is Stephen Fox. He's the founder of Next Gen Financial Planning. Stephen, welcome to the program. Hey, good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me on today. Stephen, tell us a little bit about Next Gen Financial Planning and specifically, who are the types of folks that you serve? Sure. So uh, Next Gen Financial Planning was created in order to serve younger clients that are often ignored by most of the rest of the financial planning profession. Uh, so if you know anything about financial planning, you know that most, most firms focus on serving one of two groups, either retirees or really high net worth clients with millions of dollars. And that means that younger clients who don't meet those minimum asset thresholds or who have entirely different types of financial planning needs are, are typically ignored. Uh, and if they're not ignored, they're typically directed towards firms that focus on product sales for commission rather than on being paid directly by uh, their clients for advice. And um, it just works out much better to have a place where people can go to get answers to the questions that are relevant for their stage of life and to know that there are no conflicts of interest in the advice that they're being given. So that's why we created NextGen. What's the benefit for younger investors or people that, that want to get started early? Um, there's obviously some, some uh, benefit to that. Can you explain? Yeah, that's a big part of why I wanted to work with young clients too. Besides just being able to more closely relate to them and the fact that they're underserved, it's also that you can have a much bigger impact on somebody if you start with good financial planning earlier in life. Uh, so part of it is the, the compound interest factor that a lot of people are aware of where the more time you allow your investments to compound, the more impact it's going to have. Uh, that requires time and it requires consistency. And so if you start at the age of say 25, you can have a dramatic impact compared to starting at the age of 55. Uh, but it's more than that. It's also about being able to guide people through some key transitions that happen in your 20s, 30s, 40s around things like uh, career decisions or getting married and combining finance with the spouse or buying houses and having kids and starting businesses and all those kinds of things typically happen at younger ages. And so when you can help guide somebody through those kinds of decisions, you have a much bigger impact on their life than when you're working with somebody who is 60 or 70 and it's kind of more or less already set on their path in life. For these younger folks, are they aware that they need to get their financial houses in order or what's really their mindset in the beginning and or their fears maybe? What keeps them from even getting started? A lot of times people come to us because it's starting to get more complex than it was before and they're starting to realize that there are things that they don't know they don't know. And so it's usually some kind of triggering event that causes them to come see us. It might be that maybe they have a new job with a whole bunch of employee stock options. They have no, no idea how to figure out which ones they should exercise and how the taxes work and all that stuff. Or it might be a life event like having kids or getting married. Uh, it might be that they recently finished a residency program and now they're going to work as a physician. They have no idea how to deal with the $300,000 in student loans because that planning can actually get a little bit complicated. So it's usually driven by some kind of life event. So that, yeah, that does sound complicated for sure. Are, are there any uh, like myths or misconceptions out there that people might hold that keep them from even getting started? Yeah, a couple that come to mind are one that financial planning is really all about investing. Uh, the truth is investing is just one small part of a much bigger puzzle. So we don't only look at investments and help people with that. We also look at tax planning and estate planning and budgeting and student loans and uh, all these other areas that are all interconnected and all have important impacts that if we focus just on investing, you're really missing the bigger picture and uh, the outcomes aren't going to be as, as, as positive. And then another myth that comes to mind is that uh, only people who are really wealthy need financial planning help. And unfortunately, that's a myth that's pretty pervasive even within my profession. That's why a lot of firms only work with clients who are retiring or really high net worth because they think that those are the ones who need financial planning help. And that's simply not true. The fact that somebody doesn't have a million dollars to be able to invest or that they're not retiring within the next couple of years, that, that does not mean that they don't need financial planning help, not by a long shot. I can imagine that's a common myth. People think, hey, I don't have any money to manage, so what's yeah. the point? Yeah. So, but, but the reality is, as you mentioned, you could start with a small amount. Like, can you tell us a little bit about like, what are the minimums? Like, how little do you, can you start with? Oh, we don't have any investment minimum. Uh, so part of the reason why minimums exist at a lot of firms is because they charge based on a percentage of the investments that they manage for you. So if you're charging, say, 1% per year on investments, yeah, they do have to have a minimum because if you have somebody with their first $500 Roth IRA, you can't charge uh, $5 a year and make any reasonable business out of that. Uh, so we don't have that because we want to work with people that haven't yet had the opportunity to build up larger investment accounts just because they're young and haven't had time yet. Or maybe they're not in super high paying professions. 
uh, or maybe rather than investing money inside investment accounts, they have everything tied up inside an employer 401k or a business that they started or real estate or something like that. So we don't want to have any investment minimums because it can shut out all of those groups of people. So what we do instead is we just have a flat annual rate that people pay and it covers both financial planning and investment management. Sometimes people have zero investments with us. Sometimes they have a couple million with us and the rate that they pay just depends on the complexity of their situation and how much work we expect to be doing for them. When you start working with these younger folks, do you find some common like big mistakes or pitfalls that everybody kind of falls into that you can warn the people about? Yeah, I think one one big oversight a lot of young people have is they don't recognize that up until you're pretty late in your career, typically your biggest financial asset is your future income. Uh, so it's not the value of your house or your 401k or anything like that. It's your future income. And so protecting that future income against different times of risks should, should be a big focus for a lot of younger people. So one example of that is disability insurance. A lot of people have no idea that disability insurance even exists, that that's a thing that they should be worried about, uh, but it really can help protect against one of the biggest risks that they have to their future financial health. Uh, so that's one thing that we take a close look at. Sometimes they have employer policies that are provided, and sometimes those are really helpful. Sometimes there are big gaps there, and it's worth considering getting an outside policy on their own. Uh, but that's one area that a lot of people overlook. And I, uh, there are other ways to protect against that risk too, like being thoughtful about which employer you go work for, or um, is it worth investing in the, the time and money that it takes to get an MBA or, or make this or this career decision? Just be very thoughtful about what you're doing to protect and grow that future income stream. That, that's a great insight right there, absolutely. Stephen, how, what inspired you to get started in, in working with younger folks and their finances? How did you get started? Well, I first found out about financial planning industry uh, when I was in college. So uh, after high school, I was in the Marines for eight and a half years, went to San Diego State University, and I was enrolled in their finance program there at first. And there was a student group there called the Finance Investment Society, where they would bring in speakers who work in all different areas of finance and talk about what they do. And one evening, a speaker came in talking about the work that he did as a personal financial planner, helping families make decisions about their own finances. And before he came in to talk to us, I didn't realize that that career existed, that that was a thing you could do is help people with their personal finances. i had had no exposure to that before. I thought I would end up working in corporate finance or uh, as a fund analyst or something like that. But just hearing him talk about the impact that his work has on real people and the decisions, the options that they have inside their lives, um, that just immediately spoke to me. I, I, I happened to be really lucky that I was already at San Diego State where they had a really good financial planning program that had been in existence for several decades already. And so it was very easy for me to switch over to that and uh, started calling every financial planner in town that would answer my calls or emails and meeting with them to learn more about what they do. And I uh, decided that I wanted to start this firm right out of school myself in order to work with younger clients that, like I said, weren't getting much attention from most of the other firms in town. That's terrific. And Stephen, thank you for your service. Uh, before I ask you my last question, for folks listening that like um, are, are really realize that they need to get their financial houses in order and they're considering you know, looking for an advisor, What's the most important thing they should consider when choosing an advisor? What should they look for? Yeah, we can talk about this all day. So the, <laughs> some of the first few things that come to mind are, one, you want to make sure you work with somebody that works with other people like you. So, for example, we wouldn't take on somebody who has a lot of international tax or asset issues because we don't work with other clients like that. We're not experts in that area, right? We don't work with people who are evaluating uh pension decisions and social security claiming strategies and uh, the other things specific to retiring or high net worth clients, uh, we don't take on those people because we're not experts at it. And so whatever your situation is, when you're thinking about the needs that you have, the main questions that you have, make sure you're working with somebody that deals with those types of questions all the time that they're experts in. They don't need to spend the time to do research. They're not guessing at things. They're not consulting outsiders. They've seen your situation a hundred times before. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, two other key things that come to mind would be one, I would recommend working with somebody that has some meaningful professional credentials. So a certified financial planner is a great one to look out for. Another one is if they are a, a CPA, a certified public accountant. And then also if they have a, a separate designation related to that called PFS, I think it's personal financial specialist. Uh, that's a very credible one. Uh, CFA, a charter financial analyst, that's a very credible one if you're looking for help with investments specifically. So just make sure that they are actually well-educated and have meaningful professional credentials. There are a whole lot of credentials out there that don't actually mean anything. You basically just sign up online and pay a few dollars and then you can put some letters after your name. Make sure that whatever they're claiming to have been educated in is something that's actually worthwhile. And then the third thing that comes to mind is 
Uh, most people should consider working with a financial planner who is fee only. That means that they're paid directly by their clients rather than having commissions for product sales because those commissions can introduce conflicts of interest. And you wanna make sure that if they tell you something that they're doing so because they think it's what's best for you, not because it's what's best for them. Sage advice. Steven, so for folks that would like to speak with you, how can they find you, connect with you and learn more? They can learn more about us and reach out at nextgenfinancialplanning.com. Terrific. Stephen, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing with my audience today, and I wish it continued success for you and for all of your clients. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. That was Stephen Fox, founder of Next Gen Financial Planning. And this segment's been brought to you by BooksGrowBusiness.com. It's the place where busy professionals get their books done to educate their consumers, grow their practices, and leave a legacy. That's all for now. I'm Mark Imperial, and thanks for tuning in.